actually saved the doing for this morning. So this is just the last one you're going to have me for, just in the interest of time. Um, what I thought we'd do today is we'd actually take a look at things. So you're looking at sacred texts. I talked a bit about uh, various things yesterday uh, to do with where these texts came from, the core ideas in them. I'll go over a bit of that again. Can you, the object of this is I'm going to give you a text. I'm going to give you one of the Jataka tales, which is from the Sutta Pitaka. So remember the three baskets from yesterday, three the Tripitaka. Try, it's an Indo-European word that is common to many um, language families through that part of the world and ours. A lot of language families have try or three as their thing symbolizing three things. It's amazing how language families, um, how languages are so close. You wouldn't think we'd have anything in common with Hindi, but we actually do. Uh, it's like a lot of Asian languages too. Uh, the word for three in most East and Southeast Asian languages is Sam. So in three, like Samsung, right? We all know what Samsung is. So we, we like Samsung, Big Chief. Samsung means three stars. It's Korean, I believe. In Chinese, it's Sam, I think. In Thai, I'm saying in Thai, because that's the only Asian language that speaks Sam, rising time. It's three, so anyway, it's amazing to me. Tripitaka. First of all, there's the um, the Sutta Pitaka, the Vinaya Pitaka, which is the, the monastic code, what the monks should do. Okay, so a text that really influences and informs contemporary life. And then the Abhidharma Pitaka, and Abhidharma, especially in Mahayana philosophy, is the uh, sort of the commentary on the text. It's the more precise way to access it. Okay, so we're going to have a look at something from the Jataka. Pitaka, I'm not sure if you've done any of this, but the Jataka Tales, or Jataka Pitaka, is, uh, is the stories of the Buddha's former lives, or the existences that brought his existence into being. Remember yesterday I said the thing about the candle? I really want you to remember that when talking about Buddhism and former lives and future lives and reincarnation. It doesn't mean there's not a you that will transmigrate. More on that in a minute. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to go over some of these core concepts again to freshen your brains up. We're going to do a little bit of reading. We're going to then go through the text and try and identify to make it easier for you guys. Just think of the eightfold path that you're already familiar with. Try and find elements of that in this text. This is a Jataka tale from one of the Buddha's previous lives where it's called the Prince of Patience, okay? And it's interesting to me too that this text, being as old as it is, it's about 2,000 years old, maybe slightly less. Um, the moniker Prince of Patience uh, in a lot of Theravadan countries is, is what they have on their little inscription on their Buddha statues. So I can try and find a photo later, but the large, really famous Buddha in Pitsanolok in the middle of Thailand, it's one of the most beautiful in the country. I will show you a photo before we break, but that has like the Prince of Patience, and it relates to that story. So that's how we're going to do what we're going to do. So, Jen, so I would write some of these down. I would don't need to write a PhD thesis, just get these core concepts, yeah? So the key idea is we went from our naked bloke here, the founding of the heretical movements, we went off on a few tangents. The key ideas that are common to both, and you find within the Vedas, within the Upanishads, the later commentaries on salvation, and then even as late as the uh, Mahabharata, the Indian epic on, on divine kingship, you find these themes throughout. You find them in Buddhist texts as well. So karma, obviously. What do we understand karma to be year 11? Gus? It comes back around to you. Okay, it comes back to you. Anything else? Any other way to say it? No? Okay, that's cool. Um, remember I said Jainism, Jainism or Jainism, Mahavira was the uh, the founder of which, and there's a rumor that he was a contemporary of the Buddha and they may have had an argument once or twice, but that just might be a convenient way of projecting. Mahavira's idea of karma was the same thing, what you do comes back to you, but his was an actual physical stuff that sticks to you, that sticks to your soul, and there is a permanent migration. Buddha was different, he rejected all of that. Karma was not stuff, karma was cause and effect. So remember I said the candle? That's the cause and effect. That candle being lit and touching that causes that flame to come into being even after that one's snuffed out. So karma, I don't want you to think about it, especially in Theravadan ideas, 
as I will be reborn as. When, when I die, according to this theory, which is inevitable, most people can't get their heads around it, when, when Michael Pierce dies, there won't be a Michael Pierce. Okay, in Buddhism. I'm talking about that, I'm not encroaching on the dominant tradition of our school or anything. Purely in these theoretical terms, Michael Pierce dies, there'll be no more. Half of you are probably going, oh, I can't wait. I'm just kidding. Um, there'll be no more. There'll be nothing left. There'll be no me to go anywhere. There'll be no heaven, no hell, no transmigration. However, another life will come into being. Things that I've done, footprints I've left in this world, will resonate. And this is the um, doctrine in the early Sutta Pitaka of dependent origination. I would like you to write that concept down, gentlemen. Dependent origination. Okay. And this idea is, so it's not as simplistic as, oh, I have two kids, so I live through them. No, they're their own people. But because I met my wife and we got together and we had two children, because of actions in our lives, we have two kids. And depending on who they have social interactions with, all this sort of stuff, they will leave footprints in this world, for lack of a better term. So, teaching you blokes. Half of you will probably, most of you will probably forget me. Um, which is fine with me, it's not an ego-oriented thing. But let's just say, like, Gus is going on the immersion. We go on the immersion, he learns a bit, he discovers a thing about himself, and he's 65 years old, I'm long dead, and he looks back and he thinks, yeah, yeah, that PSC wasn't too bad, eh? He taught me a bit about Thailand, and, and I had this moment, and that really influenced my life. And then he goes and tells his, I don't know, you're going to have boys or girls, Gus, or, or you don't want to think about that. Yeah, yeah, a bit, a bit too much at this stage. So he goes, <laughs> he goes and tells his significant other or his children about this wonderful experience he had. Do you see what I'm saying here? Whether it be negative or positive, maybe I do something horrible to Gus and I, I sell him to a, you know, people smugglers in Thailand. So I'm joking. As an example, I do something horrible to him and he's scarred for life and he ends up abusing somebody because of that and being mean to them and being violent. See how what I've done in this world resonates? That's what you need to think of when you come to Buddhist conceptions of karma. Okay? It is not a you to, uh, to be reborn. However, moving on to our next point, rebirth in samsara, transmigration. In Hinduism, when this all started, there was some debate about whether there was an Atman in Sanskrit, A-T-M-A-N, which means self, immutable self-soul, for lack of a better term. term. But the Buddha turned that on its head and said, no, what's real is this theory of an-atman, which means non-self. Okay? So there's all these debates about this, this is why I'm going into it. So in Buddhist texts, we have this no-self. Okay? Samsara is the cycle of birth and rebirth, and in my analogy with Gus and his trip to Thailand, whatever I do, if I'm nice or if I'm horrible, this cycle of birth and rebirth, there will be another rebirth at some point because of my negative and my positive actions in this world. My daughter was having a conniption last night, and instead of standing over and screaming at her, I just went, look, Zara, we need to get you into bed, sweetie. Get her a big hug, calm her down. She was quite happy. Had I been like, I feel sometimes, and stood over, why don't you just go to bed? She probably would have really arced up. She, <laughs> just freaked those blokes out walking past. She probably would have felt really guilty about something she couldn't understand. She probably would have something. If that happened repetitively, maybe in her future as an adult she would have had some behavioural issues. I don't even know this again. The way though, Buddha moving on from rebirth, this idea that there will be some knock-on effect is the goal. As you already know, Nirvana or Nirvana or the cessation of suffering. The cycle of samsara no more. And that's where Buddhists think of the Buddha, the historical Buddha, Gautama, as being now non-existent. The cycle of suffering is no more. You have to excuse me a bit this morning. I just actually took a serious head knock in the sports shed. You know the big yellow thing that we put ice and water in, fell on my head, and I've got this huge lump, and I'm feeling a bit of well. So just, if I pause and look blank, I'm not going to pass out or anything. Thus, in the early Sutta Pitaka, the sayings of the Buddha, OK, 
okay, and the Vinaya Pitaka, this idea of renunciation, of renouncing the world. And my question to end this lesson today is how can a religion whose core idea is to renounce the world function in contemporary society? And I'm going to introduce you to a bit of that if we get some time. So techniques cultivating release. Yoga was popular back then, and it's not the hipsters doing you know this stuff on television and you know, Russell Brand going to his yoga thing and being quite vocal about it. Yoga was actually a technique for liberation in ancient India, a technique for the release of moksha. It's called the, the Hindu version of nirvana, although they are different. Nirvana is the cessation of suffering. Moksha is liberation from the cycle. What they actually how they're conceptualized is very different, but moksha, this is the goal, similar to Buddhism, but the Buddha put a different spin on it. The techniques, body modification, mortification, I showed to the bloke who was naked, who was just cruising around with a fan. I've been to India and seen a fellow with, um, sitting by the train station in, in Mumbai, with his hand up like this, and it was all withered, nothing left, and his nails were all locked. He'd been holding his hand up for like 25 years or something. What's the point of that, do you think? Because to renounce the world, to get away from the fact that he has a body and wants to be in it and enjoy it. Most of us, you know, the Westerners living here in Cairns, we are in body, we like being in body. I personally like being in body, I like being in body. Most when I'm off work and I'm sitting on my couch, sitting on a nice glass of something. Holding your arm up or cutting yourself or sitting in a lotus position until your legs go numb and don't work anymore, which happens, is this way of renouncing the world. It's not causing pain to enjoy it. It's a way of going, this is not real. This can suffer very quickly. This, this is so impermanent and this will not be around for very long. Okay, that's the point. Meditation though, and as I said yesterday, the Buddha preached a middle road Meditation was the key for him. And just very quickly on that note, the story of the Buddha's enlightenment, which I won't go into today because we don't have time. When he left, he became one of these wandering ascetics. He became a self-mortifier. He, you know, self-flagellators, the guys who whipped themselves and so forth. He became like that. So he wandered for a um, I think it was seven years, seven to ten years, could be wrong on that. The point is, is that he wandered around renouncing the world. And this is a really famous statue of the Buddha, the emaciated Buddha, where he started subsisting on one grain of rice a day. So the story goes. Okay, he ate very little is the point. In an effort to say, no, this body is not worthy of anything. What's really real is beyond this phenomenal world. Okay? Mr. Pierce went and hit the table, we all experienced it. It's real, but it's still an experience. Okay, and he responded to that as, uh, this is not real. This is just all condition, dependent origination, or conditioned arising. So he gets into this state, he's emaciated, he's, he's, you know, his stomach is all sunken, you can see all his ribs and his windpipe, and he's you know, on the verge of death. And he wakes up one day and he came from this, not literally McDonald's and donuts and stuff and KFC, but he was a prince, he lived a life of luxury, his father gave him everything. Hundreds of concubines, life of absolute luxury, he lived in the palace tower with fine silks and people to wait on him and all this sort of stuff, ate whatever he wanted. Uh, quite literally as he got older, his, when I said concubines, his father gave him hundreds upon hundreds of young women to sleep with. He, he could do whatever he wanted, but it wasn't satisfying. And he went to the other extreme, and this is the earliest Sutta Pitaka talks about this. And this is the model, okay? So this is how my question and your learning about sacred texts come together. How do sacred texts inform the lives of Buddhists? Or how do sacred texts or how do Buddhists refer to their sacred texts and make meaning out of them for their own life? It's this avoidance of extremes. So as opposed to the, the you know, the, the neo-American lifestyle here where we've got our giant guy munching on something, Maccas and donuts and KFC and this, this life of excess that has come to characterize the late 20th and early 21st centuries. It's not supposed to be like this, it's somewhere in between. Eat healthy food, what you need to eat to be healthy. Do exercise, what you need 
to sustain your body because you are here alive right now and that is dependent on all those things but you are here and you need to do something with that okay this middle road so don't go super pataka version of exercise and eating would be avoid all that all the time don't starve yourself exercise don't go and become a bodybuilder or some crazy athlete and become obsessed and fixated and crave for something just be helpful And what inspired all this, gentlemen, is a brief, this is a Thai relief. We actually know that's Burmese. Um, that's a Burmese painting because of the language at the bottom. What inspired all this is when the Buddha was living this life of luxury, he decided that this wasn't enough, there's something going on. He went for a walk one day, with, as one does when they're a prince, they go for a walk, they have an entourage. And he's cruising out, and he went out and thought, what's, you know, what's happening in the Buddha? But the first day, these, these are meant to be read across, these, these are murals, okay, in Thai and Burmese temples, they often have a story that has some kind of chronological arrangement that's left to right, like the writing goes. The first day he saw uh, a really old man, and this troubled him, and he thought, you know, what's this, what's going on here, old man, I'm going to get old, I'm going to have all these people to wait on me, and these, you know, women that my dad provide, and this lush food and everything, what's going on here? So he went home and was in trouble. Then the next day he went out and he saw a really sick man, somebody who was on the edge of, of you know, dying. This troubled him too, same story. Third day he went and he saw a corpse, a dead person, and went, death? He didn't know death. He was sheltered from it. And then this is actually missing from this one. On the fourth day he went out and he saw a wandering monk, a mendicant, or an ascetic, as we talked about yesterday. And he decided, to renounce the world and emulate that lifestyle. However, once he was near death, he realized this was not the idea. But what finds representation in all Buddhist scriptures, okay, right from the earliest Sutta Pitaka, the sayings of the Buddha, through the development of the Vinaya Pitaka, the monastic code that was written down 500 years later, um, to the Jataka tales, which then became part of the Sutta Pitaka in the later, people started thinking about all the things the Buddha had said about former lives and interpreting them. And then the Abhidharma, the, the higher pollutant philosophy on it. The common thread, guys, is suffering. And Dukkha, this is really important for what we're going to read today. The common thread is the avoidance or the cessation of suffering. It's not about, I want to be reborn as a king, although many common people do that. I want to be reborn as somebody, a rock star with lots of money. I know Thai people who just be like, I just want better rebirth. Sort of that lay version of Buddhism, that, that non-monastic version, that non-textual version. Birth is dukkha, decay is dukkha, disease is dukkha, death, I'm going to change it to say suffering now, death is suffering. To be united with the unpleasant is suffering. To be separated from the pleasant is suffering. Not to get what one desires is suffering. In brief, the five aggregates five things that make you what you are, okay, uh, of attachment are suffering. So anytime something wonderful stops happening, we suffer. We go see an awesome movie or an awesome concert or something, right? And when at the end you're like, I don't want this to end, that's suffering. It's not a pleasant sensation. Most of us can deal with it, right? But sometimes you, you really, I don't want this to end. We're sitting on a beach in Thailand in January this year, looking out of the Gulf of Thailand and it's a really nice resort I was like, I don't want to go back home right now. I love my job, love my home, love where I live. Just want to sit here by the pool for a few more days. It's suffering. I had to get up at five in the morning, pack two kids up, drive for three hours to the airport, get on a plane to Hong Kong. That was a horrible trip. I did suffer because neither of my children slept the whole way home. You see my point? So you think in your life, you come to school, oh, I'll get it so hard this morning, you know, busy taking it. That's suffering. You get in trouble, that's suffering. Something good happens, you're like, yes, this is awesome, and then it stops, that's suffering. Your pizza gets eaten, your McDonald's is done. See my point? And this is that thread, as I said, we're gonna have a look at some text and try and identify that stuff. Craving I did yesterday, the, you know about the Nirvana or the Nirvana. From the earliest Sutta Pitakas though, gentlemen, here's, this is interesting. 
Actually, this is the Vinaya Pitaka. It's not the, the, it is a saying of the Buddha, but it's in the monastic code. It's at the very beginning of it. The complete cessation of suffering is nirvana, blowing out, see why my candle analogy works? Blowing out extinction. But sir, isn't that suffering? Is it like, like eternal death or something? No, it's not. It's a state beyond the, divert, the dichotomy of death and life. These are black, and you can't have the concept of death without life, can you? We are alive, we think about that. It's beyond concepts. It's not something I want us to do today because it's, I can't get my head around it. I have a PhD in this area. There is monks, a domain where there is no earth, no water, no fire, no wind, no sphere of infinite space, no sphere of nothingness. This is an interesting comment. No sphere of infinite consciousness, no sphere of neither awareness nor non awareness. There is not this world, there is not another world, there is no sun or no moon. I do not call this coming or going, nor standing or dying, nor being born. It is just without support, without occurrence, without object. Just this is the end of suffering. It's pretty confusing, but I really like that. No, there is neither awareness or non-awareness. So it's not some state of eternal sleep, eternal death, in distinction from being alive and awake and enjoying your life. It's something we can't actually get our heads around. And all the Abhidharma Pitaka talks, goes into this in detail about the nature of Nibbana and stuff. The Buddha himself said, forget about it. Ananda, his number one disciple, he said, well, you know, what, are we to, what are we to talk about when people ask us about after death? And he goes, forget about it. There's no reason, you're dead. There's no need to talk about it. What you need to talk about is how to achieve the cessation of suffering. And the Buddha, he never answered the question. Never answered the question once. No sphere of infinite. No sphere of nothingness. No fear of somethingness. It's basically something we cannot understand, but we need to strive for it. You already know this, but what I want you, I just want to remind you, because I want you to look for these very, very soon in this text I'm about to give you. So out of this, how do we achieve the cessation of suffering? The Sutta Pitaka, one of the earliest texts, this is laid down. Wisdom, Pana, in Sanskrit, not Pali. Yeah, that's Sanskrit. Wisdom, the idea of having the right mindset. You know, those guys, you go to school with them, those blokes, anything can happen to them, nothing bothers them. We all know somebody like that, right? Yeah? And we think, why can't it be like that? I do, I freaking hate re reacting to things. Right view. So how to achieve this? The truth of Buddhist teachings. For a Buddhist, I'm not trying to convert anyone. The truth of Buddhist teachings. To have a view of the world that is one that this is all conditioned arising, dependent origination. When I say conditioned arising, it just means the same thing. have this view of the world that this is all based on something. You're all here because mum and dad met. It's very simplistic. You're all here because of the unlikely event that two cells would join together, and that was very unlikely for all of us. You're here because you happen to live in this place at this time. It is all pure luck. It's all because of what's gone before us. The room, the place, the school, everything. Our view of the world. Right intention then, your resolution that you see the world in this way and you will follow the path. To cease suffering. Now, this is what's interesting, is that for lay people, for people like us, say we're all going to become Buddhists tomorrow, well, how does this bother? I'm not going to become a monk, I'm not walking around naked in India for the next 25 years to achieve enlightenment. No, you're not. But as a lay person, you would still be following this. Your resolution to follow the path is to wake Jay up, is to help other beings from, so he's suffering because he's bored, you see. So to help other beings from suffering. And the mangy dog, you give it a home and some food to do good works. Then your conduct, silla. Right, speech, action, and livelihood. Don't say horrible things to people. Even when they really annoy you. Right action, renunciation of taking life, of taking what is not freely given, and sexual misconduct. Okay, so most lay Buddhist monks are banned from having sex at all. We shouldn't be, shouldn't be having sex with anyone. Um, 
On that note, when a monk, a Thai monk or a Theravada monk is sitting there and you go and give them a gift, if you're a female, which none of you are, but like my wife, for example, had to, you have to take a cloth and put the thing on a cloth and hand it to them because they're not allowed to touch a woman. Make of it what you will. Right action, oh sorry, I've been over that. Right action is also uh, no stealing, drug use, alcohol, labor just aren't supposed to get messed up. But they often do. Tigers drink a lot. But lay people have a different set of rules. Monks should not drink. Monks should not eat after 12 p.m. Monks should not do a lot of things. In fact, there's hundreds of things, hundreds of uh, 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 directives for monks. Right livelihood. So avoiding occupation is not conducive to a Buddhist life. So you don't go and work in an abbot's while slaughtering animals. At the end of my PhD, I was offered a job from a mining company in Laos. Uh, so I can speak a little bit of Laos, not that much, but because I lived in Thailand. It was a gold mine, and I'm going to pay me a ton of money to go and basically convince the locals that this was a good idea and be the advocate of the mining company to the locals because of my in-country knowledge. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. That's immoral to me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to help you exploit these people that I do actually care about. Uh, do I want to go and live like them? No. But my good conscience says no. So I became a teacher because I believe it. I really like my job. I, it's the social aspect of it. I, I really hope, and some of you might think I'm full of it, that's fine, but some of you who do know me quite well know that I actually really want to impart something good that you can take away and use in your life to make it easier for you. Okay? Meditation then, the way to get achieved is samadhi, which means meditation. Right effort, mindfulness, and concentration. So the effort, not too much, not too little. The effort means not doing it for your own self-gratification. I'm a master meditator, man. I'm so awesome. No, no, it's not about your ego. It's about achieving enlightenment. Let's move right on. Right mindfulness is an awareness of what is happening, of seeing things as they really are. So as I said, all this conditioned arising, dependent origination. When another teacher mouthed off at me the other day, the uh, manifestation of this, even though I'm not a Buddhist, could possibly have been, I'm sure he's suffering, he's craving, he's clinging to something. I should just be mindful and be kind. It doesn't mean take it, it just means see things for what they really are. Alright, we are running out of time. So what I want to do is end this. Actually, go back to the Eightfold Path to inspire you to think about it. Alright, I want to have a bit of a chat, a bit of a read, so take one and pass them on. So you have to get up. Take one and pass them on. There's a couple of readings in here, gents, and just for the next half an hour, we're going to have a bit of a look, a bit of a squeeze, and then answer that question. We'll try and pick out in the text elements of Buddhist uh, doctrine that you understand. So, concepts, theories, anything. Impermanence, all the stuff you could have, should have been writing down. Impermanence, anatman, no self. Any element from the Noble Eightfold Path that suddenly has disappeared from my screen. What's happening? Can I go back, please? Yeah, awesome. Thanks for knowing what you write down. I appreciate that. Alright, we'll just go with that. Okay, so, I just want to go through this with you. The history of the world and the universe in Buddhism is quite large, okay? I know that it is in other religions too. And in Christianity, that's probably not a good idea. In Christianity, we have this idea, well, some sects of Christianity have an idea that the world may be 6,000 years old. The Catholic Church doesn't really hold on to that anymore. It's more the uh, neo-evangelicals, Protestants, literal interpretation of the Bible, even though it's still, we think of infinite, infinity, we think in long periods of time. The Buddhist universe is incredibly old, and people actually talk about it in terms of aeons. Okay, many aeons ago, Dipankara, the former Buddha, was there, and he met Gautama in a previous life. When I talk about an aeon, the best way, or an eon, it's a, it's a long period of time, right? And the best way I ever got uh, 
introduced to this concept. Oh, thanks. I shouldn't have given that out. Cheers. Just chuck it on that table. Thanks, man. And Alan, if you took, if you had a big um, square of marble that was a hundred miles square in every direction, and you took a piece of silk and you wiped it once a century, an Alan is how long it takes for it to wear down. So that's why it's called an Alan because it's a long period of time. Why I'm telling you this is that the story of the, the Buddha's former lives and how he became to be a Buddha includes this idea of aeons of time between Buddhas and that there has been a Buddha before the one we talk about and there will be another one in the future. Okay? In Theravada Buddhism there is only these three Buddhas. There's Dipankara, the one that taught Gautama how to be a Buddha, set him on the path, then there's Buddha that started Buddhism as we know it, that we're learning about, and then there's Maitreya, which I'll talk about in a little bit of time. So I've just given you this intro here. Shakyamuni's, Shakyamuni means the, the sage of the Shakya tribe, that was his, his people, the Shakyas, it was a little principality, city-state, a large tribe. There is a, a story here I just provided for you if you're interested to go, to go further, his meaning and how he got onto the path. But the one I want to look at is 2B, if you could turn to that on page 26 at the bottom. The Bodhisattva is a creature of patience. And Bodhisattva means somebody who has vowed to achieve enlightenment, but more specifically somebody who has vowed to be on the path for the benefit of other beings. Okay? So, what I'd like you to do guys, it's now half past, I'd like you to take 10 minutes to, to just quickly read through that. It's only a couple of pages long, it's one, two, three, nearly four of those little pages. Okay? So we're only reading up to three, outline of a Bodhisattva's progress. Just read this, the Bodhisattva as a creature of patience for me. I'll then give you the context. And while you're reading, one last task, can we just try and identify anything from these texts that we've discussed or that you already know in this? Try and find a manifestation of it. Okay? For example, he was meditating under a tree when the concubines found him. Right intention. His resolution to follow the path was very obvious because what he was doing when people found him was engaged in that meditation action. Does that make sense, what we're doing? Cool. I'll give you 10 minutes to do that, gents. <coughs> Let's get through this.
Well, you can access it through a web browser, yeah. It's just like Google Drive or MSO 365. But do what you're supposed to do now, Ross. This is important. Okay. We only have 20 minutes left. What's it called, though? iCloud. Just iCloud.com. Do you use a Mac at home? Yeah. yeah do you store your like pages, docs in iCloud or anything? So it's, really, it's just like Google Docs. Google Docs is just as good. In fact, it's probably a little better. This is a bit slow sometimes, but I, I yeah, prefer my, my photos. I have like 40 gig of photos from all the years, so because I have a Mac and I have an iPhone, it all just is on every device because it's all stored in the cloud. And then I don't have to worry if my Mac goes over the side of a boat in the Mekong River and my phone gets stolen by some ruffians in Laos, which almost happened once, um, it's all in the cloud. That's another story. They weren't on the path, believe me, those guys. They were crazy. I got chased at one in the morning by a gang of high and opium with machetes. Nearly died. Luckily, I can climb. No, they weren't going to run. I jumped over a case with broken balls and spikes on top of it. They were going to go. That's a good story. It's weird. I got locked out of my guest house and no one like the camera started circling me on their motorcycles. Hey, how's it going? You know, it's a lot of energy. I was around. Taking the sides, you know. Have a look. See the one with the one from the other side. All right, Jens, how are you going, Ali? We all finished? Read through it? Yeah. What happens when the king comes and meets him? Cuts his what off first? Hands. Hands. Then what? Hands. Well, how does he react to that first? What? What did he? Hang on. He cuts the hands off first, and how did the Buddha feel about it? He didn't care about his hand. It says the pain from his hand didn't bother him, but he did feel pain about something else. What was that? The, 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 the king's own. His pain lay. Can somebody read it out for me? His pain lay in. Yep. So, what I'm trying to illustrate is if we've all probably been in some kind of a stuff in our life. I hope you haven't, but somebody comes and punches you in the face. Do you feel pain for them? Do you feel often oh, so sorry for this poor bloke? So, so deluded by craving to pleasure and being a big man. Wow. Full on. I wish you all... You don't feel like that, do you? You feel pretty angry, don't you? Yes, I'm... John, I know how you feel about that sort of thing. But, um... <laughs> so, which one of these? Can we see represented in that text? Or which one of these is that text trying to teach people? Right, conduct? Yeah, but let's be specific. Let's be specific. I can see a couple. The fact that something really bad has just happened to this human, he's had his hand cut off. And it doesn't bother him. And he didn't feel any pain. So resolute, what does it say? He didn't feel any pain. He felt so firm in his adherence to patience. So which one? So firm in his adherence to patience. Right intention, the wisdom to see things for what they really are. Right speech, he didn't mouth off at the bloke. Come on, Milo, you need to do something like this, I've been told, very soon, apparently. You need to be able to look at texts and, and see how they inform things, so I suggest you do this activity. What do you think, those of you who are interested and who are getting into it, getting into it who, are, who are seeing a bit here, what do you think the king actually represents? Yeah, yeah, or... It says it's very, very um, telling. His pain lay in seeing the terrible fate of this butcher, accustomed to pleasure, would meet in the future. I left it up there yesterday afternoon, talked a bit about it, started some tea and barley, which is thirst, craving. 
Okay, so the king and his concubines and all his people, his laziness, he's asleep. It's implied that he's quite large, he has a lot to eat. He's, he's, this is the embodiment of craving, the thirst. And the Buddha's on his path, he's meditating, he's exemplifying right effort, right concentration, right livelihood, right action, and he meets this embodiment of craving. Don't think of the king as an evil person, he wasn't. Uh, even the, the, the story of Jataka, the Sutta Pitaka of the story of Mara, the, the tempted deity, is not a Buddhist Satan or anything like that. Just embodiments of craving. So the Buddha meets this guy, lops off a hand, but the Bodhisattva kept silent. Which one? Right speech? There's no need to say anything. If you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. You can pretty much sum it up through that saying. Bodhisattva kept silent because he regarded the king as somebody who was beyond help and who could not possibly be won over by kindness. He sorrowed for him as for a patient for whom, of whom the doctors had given up. The king, however, spoke to him in a threatening manner. And so your body will be carved to pieces till you die. This is not a nice way to die, is it? Being hacked to death. Stop this pose of piety. You roguish cunning shall be stopped. Calling him for everything. But the Bodhisattva said nothing. Because he knew uh, him for a person who could not be won over by affection. And recognised that he would persist anyhow. So the king, in the same manner, cut off the other hand. And thereafter his arms, his ears, his nose, and his feet. But no sorrow and no anger fell from Mooney, the sage. When that sharp sword his frame demolished, the engine of, his, of the body must run down. He knew, he knew, sorry, and years of practice had accustomed him to this patience. And when he saw his limbs drop off, this holy man unbroken, firm and patient, felt but exa exa uh, exaltation. What does exaltation mean? Yeah, yeah. No pain at all. What gave him anguish was to see the king so far estranged from Dharma. Do you know what Dharma means? Have you gone over that concept yet with Mrs. Lynch? Dharma can be translated, with a capital D like that, can be translated roughly as truth. Things that are really what they are. The Dharma is that life is suffering. Okay, according to the law of Dharma, the, the natural law of cause and effect, the truth of the situation. Okay, which relates to right view, seeing things as they are, accepting Dharma as the ultimate truth. Those who are in great, uh, sorry, those who are great in true insight, whose minds are governed by pity for others, heed not the ill that befalls them, but that which troubles their fellows. But the king, having done this terrible deed, forthwith succumbed to a violent fever. He rushed from the garden and the great earth, opening wide, devoured him. The best of sages, however, who, thanks to his reliance on forbearance, have throughout remained firm and unshaken in his fortitude, ascended to heaven as a temporary reward for his patience. So remember yesterday I said, rebirth is a god? And then I was asked, but hang on, it's an atheist religion, what's going on, sir? There's no gods. There are, but they're not the god. Okay, it's, a, it's a simplistic way to think about it, but in textual Buddhism, within the Sutta Pitaka in particular, within the Abhidharma, the commentary on the sayings of the Buddha, the notion of, um, sorry, I'm just wondering what that kind of fellow is walking across the aisle with an apron and swinging a set of keys for it. It's just yeah, that's very, gracious. very unsettling. Uh, it's, not, it's really throwing my train of thought, actually. It's quite random. No, don't. Focus on me, guys. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've totally lost my train of thought. Um, the idea of there being no gods or no god, think about Buddhism as there's many gods, there's many levels to heaven, there's hundreds of levels to heaven, and one can be reborn in a lower level heaven. The lower levels are like still like beings that have bodies, and the higher up you get, they're kind of ethereal beings. That Anyway, it's very abstract. The higher up the level of heaven, the... the the less of substance the gods and beings are, and the longer they are there for. So even the big gods of Hinduism, uh, Vishnu, uh, Shiva, uh, Brahma, the creator god, okay, the Trimurti, uh, Brahma creates 
Shiva, uh, Vishnu preserves and Shiva destroys. Um, without that three, that cycle, life cannot go on. Uh, these gods will die one day and move to another station. They're not permanent. They are, for us humans, because our lives are, you know, we're lucky 80 odd years long. But these gods live for, you know, many, many aeons and aeons, but one day their karma will influence their rebirth in another place. Okay, so Buddhism takes all this. And in reward for this, I think this was actually one of the, according to the Jatakas, okay, this is one of his penultimate lives. One of the, the ones coming towards the end. He had almost achieved enlightenment. But he was rewarded in this instance by being born in a lower level heaven as a god for a time. It would have been quite a few aeons before he came back as Gautama. And that was the life through which he would be reborn. A couple of really subtle things here. We've only got six minutes left. A couple of really interesting subtle things. All through the texts, texts, we see this story of him being reborn. A man. Always. Um, actually, I've just totally misrepresented that. There are stories of him being past lives as a woman. But the one where he achieves enlightenment, the important ones towards the end, are always as a male. And therefore, in Buddhism, in, in both Mahayana and Theravada, uh, not Vajrayana, the diamond vehicle of Tibetan Buddhism, but most of Chinese and Southern Buddhism, especially in Theravada and Sri Lanka, Thailand, and all of Southeast Asia, you can only achieve enlightenment as a male, as a monk, as a human. So it is very fortunate to be born a human and a male and enter the monkhood and try and achieve enlightenment. Very few will, because as I said, once you achieve enlightenment, You've reached Nirvana, there's only three people, two people that have done that, Dipankara, the Buddha, and then the future Buddha Maitreya. Renounces his enlightenment as a Bodhisattva for to come back and help. A couple of interesting things. This story looks at that. How are women portrayed in this story? Just quickly. Did anyone pick up on that? The only women mentioned were who? Right at the beginning. He's cruising along. Lived a certain man, judicious, keen intelligence. All this sort of stuff. Young Brahmin girl came along, so that's her caste. Not a, she's not a priest, attractive, good looking. She held a water jug and seven lotus flowers. Mega Asta, is there a festival in the city? So with his harem, he took he betook himself to that forest which had all the qualities one looks for in a park. With his harem, what's a harem? Hmm? No. It's a group of women. A harem is basically a harem. A harem. A harem, maybe. A harem or a harem is is a, a situation. Uh, a, a social organisation of a man and several women. Uh, the word comes from India and the Middle East, where one important gentleman has many, many ladies, wives, some of them wives, some of them are just concubines. They're his, um, just his ladies, we'll say. Think of him in the contemporary sense, like a guy with a grill and you know, all that sort of stuff, and his women, basically. And yes, he does, he has sex with them all, right? How are women portray in this? The one who's high, who's highborn, for to cop a phrase from Game of Thrones, the one who's a Brahmin, she's doing what? Or is she in the story before? She's in the story before. She's just collecting water for the guys. And the, the women he meets in here are just members of a harem or a harem. These subtle themes come through a lot of these ancient texts in Buddhism. The key stories all surround men. Enlightenment, good deeds, is all surround men. Just something solid. Guys, there's only three minutes left. Did you do your homework? That I said to you. Of course, did you find an example? What did we come up with? And if I then, Fraser. Uh, well, I couldn't find too much stuff, but. Oh, it was a really abstract question, and it's okay. I just wanted to get you thinking. Well, most of the websites and whatnot that I had a look at said that on uh, meditation and just trying to forget um, everything was basically repeated, losing the But everything was based on what? Um, meditating and yep. forgetting about um, 
you know, what you like and... Non-craving. Yeah. So non-craving this middle path between extremes. Good. Did anybody else find anything? How yeah. the texts, the texts influence, what did, I forgot how I worded it, but how do they influence how Buddhists live? Meditation, non-craving, non-tanha. The earliest texts talk about this. So good, good phrase. Anybody else? Fraser was the only one who did his homework. Really? All right. Just to conclude, gentlemen, we'll forget about that question, actually. I would like you to take this reading away. I would like you to go through it and finish our activity. And I'll just let Mrs. Lynch know that this is what I've set you to do. It's not some grand homework task that you have to spend three hours on tonight and write an essay, but if you can go back through this and relate this to any of these textual concepts, this is one of the earliest texts. It's in the Sutta Pitaka, the sayings of the Buddha, okay, and the commentaries on them. It's a jataka, which means stories of his former life that was introduced to the Sutta Pitaka about 600 years after he died. I would like you to go back through this, given a thorough reading, and just identify and explain how this story might resonate with the Buddhists today. So as Fraser just said, meditation, renouncing things, not craving. How is this story? How can it? Okay. It's a very short introduction to this. I'm sorry we only had an hour and 45 minutes to do this. Far more time would be needed, but I hope you got something out of it. Are there any questions, gents, about Buddhism, about yeah, sacred texts, about how they, oh, how people's practice and worship is based on them? Hmm? Homework. I want you to go through this text thoroughly, and I want you to just continue to pick out those examples of how this text might influence contemporary Buddhists. How Buddhists would look to this text and think, "What does this mean for me?" Don't have a hair up there. After you do that, the bell's going to go in about 30 seconds, so pack up. Can someone get my glasses in case I'm going to deliver my own papers on the other news? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a positive. I think it's a positive. Yeah.